story that most people probably don't know is that the Philippines shut down TikTok shop after seven or eight months of it being live there because it took off such a huge percentage of online sales so quickly. It was 30 or 40 percent of online sales within six or seven months. It was that effective. What inspired you to create Creator Land? We saw an opportunity to connect the ecosystem and this industry is starting to professionalize. And as it professionalizes, it needs its own ecosystem for professional development, education, networking, talent analysis. There's this very limited interaction happening between the talent and demand sides. And so our goal is to you know, bridge this extreme gap that lives between talent and demand. Give me your most controversial hot take on influencer marketing right now. My personal opinion, my hot take is that affiliate over the next few years, I think it's going to become the new standard for creator payment. How are you positioning yourself away from it being labeled as a marketplace? One of the first principles here is focusing on relationships, not just transactions. We're building a platform for long-term professional relationship building. At Heartbeat, you pioneered the concept of nano influencer. What do you mean exactly by pioneering it? We saw there was this huge desire from both sides. Brands wanted authentic content. People were willing to post into their feeds of brands that they liked and brands that they felt resonated with them. That didn't have a name back then. There was no nano influencer term back then. So we had to go package this up in a way that people could understand, take it to brands, convince them that these regular people weren't going to go talk smack about the brand and ruin their reputation. But there was a genuine like brand affinity here that we wanted to bridge the gap on. Hello everyone, this is Shubham Tiwari. I'm the head of content marketing and socials at Philo, the universal API for creator data. And I welcome you to the second season of Impulse, uh, Google's number one rated podcast on influencer marketing. Today I have with me Brian Freeman, the founder and CEO of Creator Land. Creator Land is a professional networking platform for content creators, brand managers, influencer marketers, whoever is connected or in creator economy. Brian pioneered the concept of nano influencers at Heartbeat. His previous gig, we'll ask him uh, about that. Uh, he's also a great lecturer, investor, and a passionate advocate for AI and emerging trends. So let's welcome Brian. Uh, he has over 10 years of experience of working and building creator economy. Brian, welcome to Impulse. Thank you so much. It's awesome to be here. Give me your most controversial hot take on influencer marketing right now. So, you know, this could cause some people some heartburn, but I think the fastest route to income right now is likely creators picking up affiliate deals. You mentioned I've been in the industry now a decade. Affiliate has been a dirty word in this space for a long time um, because it kind of came out of what the blogging industry, it felt like people weren't getting paid for their time and content that they're making. They're like, hey, you know, pay me for my time. I, I deserve it. And I think that's true. But when creators have spent a long time building their audience, curating this audience, uh, especially on platforms like YouTube, where you know that takes many years of work, it can feel very disheartening to be like, well, I get paid only on what I sell. Now, there's another way to look at that. That's how entrepreneurs think too. You know, like I only get paid if I make sales, um, and salespeople only get paid if they make sales. And sometimes salespeople are the highest paid people in an industry, in a, in a company, even more than the CEO. So I think the other thing is that understanding the macro environment around the industry is just as important as understanding your day-to-day -day role in the industry. So just as much, it's just for career building. So if you are a creator who's mastered your understanding of your audience and telling stories to them, in order to get ahead, you need to understand what else is going on around you. And um, if you want to succeed. And so my personal opinion, my hot take is that affiliate over the next few years, I think is going to become the new standard for creator payment. Now, the reason for this is, you know, despite the fact that overall brand dollars are shifting towards creator spend, that's definitely true. I mean, Chamath Palahapatiya in June came out with this awesome 116 page deck uh, on his blog. Definitely recommend um, listeners read it. That talks about how Creator is really the next wave of media, TV, then internet with Google. That's where people are spending the majority of their time. Then social media, the majority of time spent there. And each time you have a new wave, that's where brands need to spend their money because that's what drives household consumption and purchases is where people are spending their time. Creators are the next wave. Um, you know, the average person spending far more time on watching creators on what was traditionally social media of connecting friends is now an entertainment platform that's by massively overtaking television and other forms of, of media. But the people who are making a lot of the purchasing decisions are people who have come up through performance. 
So the last 20 years have been about performance marketing for major, for many brands, Google, then social media performance. But the, the quality of uh, conversion has gone down and now creator is the place for that. But these people who are controlling these budgets don't think the way brand marketers and, and um, audience building marketers think. They are looking at sales. They want sales. An affiliate gives you a really good place, uh, gives you a way to do that. It's about how much product they move. They get fired if they don't move product. So if they're yeah. going to move cash over to creator, they're going to want to know they're getting something for that besides just pure eyeballs because they don't have another channel that can perform super well and creator can. So I think that as more marketing spend flows, it's coming from performance. It's not necessarily just increasing in brand and brand spending. And that means for the creator talent, the people who get ahead of this and start to figure out how to master live shopping, how to use TikTok yeah. shorts, reels to generate sales and do it in an authentic way. And storytelling, it really comes down to storytelling, yeah. are going to be the ones who are printing money compared to their peers who are waiting for that next pay per post deal. Um, right. Because if you're starting an internet brand, if you're starting a brand right now that's sold on the internet, which is 90, going to be 90% of brands. Right. You're thinking about how you can drive sales with your initial social media strategy. If you put that hat on as a creator and think of, that, think of these brands that are coming to you as your brand and how you tell those stories, you're going to nail it and you're going to make a lot more money than getting paid 300 bucks for a post or even $3,000. Yeah. And I think if you look at it like, look, I want to build a career. That takes income. Um, and figuring out a way to do that authentically in a way that you enjoy is is going to set you up for success. So that's my yeah. hot take. Affiliate is going to become the new standard because of the people who make the decisions and control the budgets. Yeah, I mean, today only I came across a post on LinkedIn that uh, compared uh, affiliate performance of uh, macro influencers versus nano influencer. And uh, the results were astonishing. Like the macro influencer with 500,000 you know, followers couldn't you know, convert much of you know, the sales. And the nano influencer it amazingly well so why don't you you know like go into your thesis of nano influencers that you built over the years what's happening there because affiliate is totally you know the next big thing as you said how do we connect those two and why nano influencers if i may summarize my question are really important for affiliate marketing i agree i think nano micro influencers have always been really important for telling stories to smaller audiences who feel a tighter relationship with that creator also as creators get larger and larger audiences, especially depending on the platform, their own incentives start to shift. You know, if you're a YouTube creator with half a million subs, your incentive is creating really high quality, long form content and driving retention on that content because that's how you're making your six to eight to nine thousand dollars a month in AdSense revenue. Uh, it's not making, you know, quick deals with brands or whatever. So the larger and then the larger your audience gets traditionally, that has led to higher performing, higher quality brand deals that are, you know, uh, I mean, sorry, higher paying, not necessarily higher performing. Unfortunately, or fortunately, brands have a little bit more power now. There's a lot of creators with large audiences. This is heavily due to TikTok, which made distribution completely different than how it had built up on Instagram. If you had 100,000 followers pre TikTok on Instagram, that probably came from either musically or five years of work. That wasn't something you built overnight. Now you can go from 5,000 followers on Instagram to 125 to 175,000 followers by building up six or seven viral videos on TikTok. So that has just shifted and partially made the landscape a little more confusing for everybody, but it means your competition's higher. And it just changes a little bit of the way you need to think about incentives. And it also might make it so that you don't necessarily have this tight of a relationship with your audience yet because they've been built really quickly. So you're still learning how to interact with this group and maximize the engagement with them and who they are and, and how this fits into your own content strategy and the things that you want to talk about. So uh, the world's, you know, TikTok really disrupted a lot of things and also reels and shorts are copied them. And that's also driving traffic moving all, all over the place. It's not the same world. So nano still have this very tight, small relationship with their audience. Also the algorithms tend to, favor smaller audiences for the first kind of initial 20% of distribution. So, hey, those people who are following you will tend to see your content more often. And if they trust you, that means they may transact as a result of that. Um, right. the, I think the last piece here, and sorry if, if this is a ramble, but 
TikTok shop and live streaming are very different distribution systems than posting into the For You page or your feed on other channels. They're heavily incentivized as of today, you know, August 2024. Going live on TikTok shop is going to get you far more distribution than just going live on TikTok or just going live on Instagram because they want that to become the new standard for shopping. So I think it's all about uh, both on the brand and talent side, understanding what's there at your, at your disposal for you know maximizing whatever it is you're trying to drive, follower growth, audience development, or sales. Right. Last question on nano influencers. Uh, do you see nano influencers of the world or let's say of the West going the China way where live commerce is going to be a big thing or, you know, the trends basically that work in Southeast Asia, China, do you see them getting replicated in the West? TikTok sure is trying. I mean, yeah. it's, it, that is the thing that TikTok cares about the most. I mean, there's a little uh, story that most people probably don't know is that the Philippines shut down TikTok shop after seven or eight months of it being live there because it took off, took up such a huge percentage of online sales so quickly. Um, it was 30 or 40 percent of online sales within six or seven months. It was that effective. Now, social selling, the idea of like, hey, you follow me, I'm selling you something. It's a blatant advertisement. It's like QVC, like live shopping. That is far more common in Asia and always has been. Like, for example, multi-level marketing or, you know, social selling, that industry is much bigger in, in Asia than it is in the West because it's a, not the same type of cultural um there's, there's no negative cultural norm applied to it in the same way. So TikTok is trying to shift Western attitudes towards live shopping. And they're doing that through highly incentivizing pricing, um, highly incentivizing distribution, and you know, rewarding the people who come in there. But TikTok has not broken through into the major brands yet. You know, this is mostly something that smaller emerging brands or what people might call like a Timu product, you know, like uh, you know, the viral mop or the viral yeah. speaker or the viral the shower head or something, yeah. you know, they're cheap. They're, they are made, they're not necessarily super high quality goods, but TikTok is doing a lot of really, you know, interesting things in order to incentivize creators who are more experienced, who are great at storytelling, and then incentivizing the brands that we see and buy all the time to, to take the risk and to take the leap into this type of uh, purchasing flow. So I think, yes, I do believe that we will start to shift in this direction because it's already happening. And um, it's just about finding the balance where people don't feel like their TikTok feed is not. I know I'm talking about TikTok a lot, but they're the ones who are really driving the industry right now. Um, where people don't feel like their whole feed is a bunch of TikTok shop live streams because that will turn people off. So they're just trying to find the balance right now. But I think that is what the future looks like. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see how Amazon, uh, you know, Target, Walmart, these other major online retailers respond to that. Because um, right now, TikTok is gaining market share really quickly. And users are the ones driving that activity. You know, the creators yeah. want to make money. Clearly. Clearly, TikTok is trying to change West's outlook on social selling, which is a very fundamental uh, consumer trait. Speaking of fundamental things. What inspired you to create Creator Land? Because it's a no-brainer to create, you know, a place for everyone, but it hasn't been done yet. Why? Why Creator Land? Yeah, you know, I don't want to get too far into the history of, uh, you know, but I've been in this industry now for a while and seen um, you know, my previous company, we, we worked with about a half million creators. We worked with over 2,000 brands, you know, somewhere between 12 and, and 14 million pieces of sponsored content. So I got to see a lot of kind of this, hyper transactional nature of this world and also shifting from experimental of hey you know maybe i can make money this way on my instagram that's kind of cool small dollars here and there to it becoming a career preference for a new generation that grew up uh, natively with talking on facetime and transitioning that to talking to an audience on tiktok this is uh, the, the way they think about it. their brains are different than millennials and gen x so it's natural that they want to do this and the rewards are there. So creator economy, no longer a fad, but, um, and I mentioned Chamath Palihapitiya's June thing that he put out, you know, this, we're disrupting right now. When I say we, I mean, you, me, the people in the creator economy, a $500 trillion market, the whole, the wow. global market for purchasing 
on household consumption is about $500 trillion. That's always driven by the dominant media platform of the time. You know, again, it was TV, then it was internet, then it was social, now it's creator. Oh, actually one last thing, this is some of my own research. Content creation is the fourth highest paying uh, job category in the United States. It's above wow. finance okay. on an hourly wow. wage basis. Uh, people school. who go, it's crazy. It's great. And I mean, yeah. if you go full time and you stick with it, the average income is about 179,000. That's four times higher than the average college educated income in the United States. So it's very attractive. And this industry is starting to professionalize. And as it professionalizes, it needs its own, you know, it needs its own ecosystem for professional development, education, networking, talent analysis. Um, what I found yeah. in building my previous company was that there's this very limited interaction happening between the talent and demand sides of things. It's typically, hey, will you do this work? Here's what I want you to do. Uh, sometimes here's a 25 page brief that talent has to like under unpack and understand and try and do the best that they can. It's happening over email. It's happening between one marketing person and 50 different creators all at the same time. There's no real relationship development happening. There's no passing of like uh, expertise happening yeah. there because it needs to happen. We're already late. We're at the, get this thing done, like get that content out there and then send a payment and maybe we'll hit you back in the future. And that kind of transactional nature to everything really reduces the uh, density of education, information sharing, and ultimately performance for both sides. So we saw an opportunity to connect the ecosystem, similar to how like Doximity did this for healthcare. Prior to Doximity, the, which is professional networking for healthcare workers and doctors, there was no connective tissue here. You, how do you go hire somebody for your, uh, for your office? They're not really on LinkedIn. It just doesn't serve that world that way. So you're doing it the old fashioned way. Well, Doximity changed that. Stack Overflow looked at the industry for developers and what do they not get out of existing solutions? How do we integrate GitHub and um, open source and developer feedback and ultimately then hiring and, and candidate review in a way that works for both sides, both the people who wanna hire and the people who need more from the other people in their industry. Um, and so our goal is to bridge you know, bridge this ex extreme gap that lives between talent and demand and um, and also talent managers, casting agents, you know, all the other people who are in this space. I was coming to that only. I mean, you're catering to not just creators, uh, influencer marketers, brand managers, casting agents, everyone who's in the cre like creator economy. So how are you going to give them, you know, uh, let's say dedicated experience on creator land because just right uh, before we hit the recording of this interview, you were saying that, you know, you're still working on giving uh, a different kind of experience to all these people. And you just spoke about, you know, building the bridge. Do you have to build many bridges? How are you going to handle this such a massive task? So uh, you do it over time. You know, you can't do anything perfect. Rome wasn't big in a day. In the yeah. beginning. That's, yeah, yeah. And I think <laughs> the way you do this is in a build, let, measure, learn cycle. I mean, that's how we've gotten to where we are today. 40,000 members and uh, 10,000 of those are on the demand side, Twenty. 4,000 are on kind of the talent side. They're high quality professionals and they are very um, forthcoming with feedback. And so we spend a lot of time with our users. Okay, did this work? Why not? What, like what's hurting, you know, what's not working for both the career land experience and off platform experience? You know, what would make your life better? And looking at how, how many of those people are in the ecosystem now who are similar to the people providing feedback and implementing features, measuring their engagement and building on that. I think the um, trying to come out the gate with like a solution that works for everybody is not, you're going to solve problems for nobody. You have to really pick a category to, to solve for. And for us, this is kind of professional creators who tend to be most often on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok generating income. But we see a lot of musicians who've joined the platform. We see a lot of oh, photographers that join the platform. We see a lot okay. of service providers, editors, um, sound engineers, people who are you know, illustrators, you know, we're seeing a, a flocking here, but we have to look at, okay, how do we solve the biggest need first and then build on that from there? So, you know, I don't know the exact answer of how we make everything better for your day-to-day -day musician today, but I think we'll get there. We just need time yeah. and we need feedback and we need to prioritize. So I, I don't know if it's not a super satisfying answer, but it is the way we think. 
So, uh, I mean, uh, I have already, you know, signed up on Creator Land and uh, creators who are watching this, we are going to provide you a link to uh, check out Creator Land. It's a very exciting platform, uh, which is in the process of becoming better. So, uh, my question is, what's your long-term vision for Creator Land? How would it look like, let's say, two years from now on or five years from now on? Is it going to be like LinkedIn? Is it going to be like Fiverr? What exactly is the vision? To the last comment first, I think it's more like LinkedIn than it is okay. like Fiverr. But it's looking through the lens of our industry. I think you know LinkedIn has been fantastic for my career. It was a big inspiration for wanting to Same do yet. this because yeah. I didn't have a lot of personal connections. You know, I didn't have uh, my finger on the pulse of the industry because you know, and I didn't have a way to become an entrepreneur in the tech industry earlier on because I just didn't know what to do. I was making websites at eleven by. 15, I was doing it for money and like, you know, building websites is something that is a precursor to internet entrepreneurship a lot of the time, yeah. but I didn't know how to make that leap because I didn't know anybody. So I got into finance and was doing banking stuff and then building computers on the side for my friends and making websites for and doing design work for, for fun and a little extra cash when I could have been building a company. Um, and so I think that that was really the inspiration for me is like having that connectivity. Now, how does it, what does it look like long term? You know, we want to be the definitive professional network for the creator economy. So the platform where creators, brands, agencies, and all stakeholders in this ecosystem come to connect with each other, come to learn from each other, to grow those careers, and ultimately transact in a, in a similar way to how you see that transactions happening on LinkedIn. That might happen in DMs. That might happen through a job board. Um, but it doesn't necessarily happen like Fiverr, where you're pulling somebody in for six bucks, 10 bucks, 12 bucks here and yeah. there. We'll see. But we want to be the go-to place for talent discovery. So that means answering the question, who worked with who, on what, with what results. Um, we want to be the place that people go for understanding the pulse of the industry. What are the trends? What is, you know, what uh, is standard right now? What was standard in the past? Where might things be headed in the future? I think... Another really important layer is professional development. So we're building out courses, resources, and eventually mentorship programs to help creators at all levels enhance those skills and advance their careers. Um, this was something LinkedIn nice. did really well. I don't want to overly index on the LinkedIn comparison, but there's a lot to be said for it. I mean, they, they bought a company in 2013 that was one of the largest online learning companies in the world. This led to the ability to do certifications to um, allow you on your own time to learn new skills and then prove that you did that, uh, which yeah. could be meaningful for future hiring opportunities or inside of your own organization. Another couple items, you know, I think data-driven insights is really, really important. That's something that's right Creators now- Creators need almost, that a lot, yeah. Gives, Philo knows this better than anybody. I mean, this is yeah. right now the de facto, de facto decision-making pathway is we start with engagement we start with follower count then we look at engagement then we might look at some keyword criteria and then we get down into the content and trying to understand whether that's the right fit um, yep. that's the whole flow and i think that there is a way to look at that a little bit differently to try and understand more about who's the best storyteller and uh proven by what they've done historically and i think that, that could lead to better outcomes um so uh, looking at a little bit a little bit differently but still very much a data-driven decision-making process. Um, I think we do have a marketplace opportunity, like yep. a, more of a pure marketplace opportunity, but we're, we're looking at that very uh, carefully because we don't want to end up another creator marketplace. There's a lot of those. I was know? just coming to that, how you going to you know, position yourself. But before that, let me really command you on your community efforts because I come from community management background. And when I see you, you know, passionately creating this community, creators, uh, building uh, you know, courses for them. I mean, you know, any community, you know, leaders out there, you know, you're doing amazingly. You should t definitely check out Creator Land. But yeah, continue to with, you know, the comparison with the marketplace. How are you positioning yourself away from, you know, being labeled as a marketplace? So the, you know, one of the first principles here is focusing on relationships, not just transactions. So unlike marketplaces that primarily facilitate one-off deals or even repeat deals, but you know, there's a disintermediation issue with many of these marketplaces. We're building a platform for long-term professional relationship building. So that means a connection isn't 
only because I'm trying to hire you for this one thing right now. It could mean we met somewhere. It could mean, you know, we share interests and there might be downstream things we might want to talk about. It might be, I love this project that you made and I want to stay connected because down the road, this could be a cool partnership or something to collaborate on. Um, I think that's really kind of a first principles item for us. Um, the other is comprehensive professional profiles that are easy to create. So going beyond basic metrics, the basic metric is follower count, engagement across multiple platforms, the, the, maybe a, a slightly more advanced, but still kind of fairly basic because it's not hard to get this data if you have the right systems in place like Philo, which I would call like keyword type matching and audience information, that kind of thing. But going beyond that to a full body of work. You know, what are the skills that these people have? What are the collaborations that they've done in the past? What was the result of those collaborations? Did the brand marketer who hired you like what you did? What'd they think? You know, was it, is it, is it a thing that actually happened? Is it verified that it, that occurred? Let's go look at that content and let's make it easy to discover that work. Um, we think that that's a pretty big difference because we're serving the creator, not the brand. Now the brand benefits. But our customer is talent. And I think that that's something that differentiates LinkedIn from Upwork and, you know, Stack Overflow from Upwork, again, really. Um, you know, they, they, those platforms need dollars flowing through to make their nut. And that means you're searching for, you're spending most of your time thinking about how to win more of those dollars from demand. And that's going to take you down a pathway that leaves the talent as a secondary citizen. And we really want to stay true to this kind of first principle of the talent is the real customer. And through serving them, we can serve the whole industry. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, uh, to bring the creator's perspective, uh, that's the biggest piece of the puzzle uh, and difference maker, of course. And speaking of, you know, making differences, uh, let's talk about your experience. The immediate, you're not going that far in the history. At Heartbeat, you pioneered the concept of nano influencers, which I talked about earlier. What do you mean exactly by pioneering it? Did you like help define it? Did you like what kind of insights you, you know, took out from it? And uh, how did it change the influencer marketing space or affiliate marketing as you have prophesized? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a great question. So uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the my previous company was a pivot from a dating app. So oh. we had started the first female focused dating app was got a ton of press, hundreds of articles, print magazines, you're getting all these users from around the world. But in order to build a good dating business, you need density. Now, uh, that, that means you need to activate marketing locally. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, that's not what, you know, if people are joining a dating app, they want to meet people. So the way that we did this initially was by going on to college campuses and engaging sororities in a competition amongst each other to see who could get the most people onto the app. And then the sorority who won, won a cash prize. So the first sorority to win was the one that posted on Instagram, Facebook, Snap, and, um, and uh, yes, both basically those three channels. Uh, they just did this on their own. And this was 2000, early 2014. So that, that was an uncommon behavior. So we got very good at these on the ground activations. But when I went out, and so we did about nine of them, uh, led to about 180,000 users of the app and very well engaged users because they were local. However, we, dating is a tough business. You know, they rarely do you succeed outside of being from one of the incumbents, like a offshoot of an incumbent. Bumble is an offshoot of Badoo in Europe. Tinder yeah. was an offshoot of Match. They had no cold start problem. Their profiles started with people who were on these other dating sites owned by the parent company. Um, so I learned the hard way. VC didn't want it. Venture didn't want to invest in it. And so it was either pivot or die. And we tried a couple of things. The last one being, well, look, if these young women in sororities posted for our brand, maybe they want to post for other brands. And that was lightning in a bottle. And so it's 2015. You know, we uh, first initial campaigns were run by me and one other guy by hand on Google Sheets with MailChimp and uh, just very off the shelf tooling. And we saw there was this huge desire from both sides. Brands wanted authentic content. People were willing to post into their feeds of brands that they liked and brands that they felt re resonated with them. That didn't have a name back then. 
There was no nano influencer term back then. So we had to go package this up in a way that people could understand, take it to brands, convince them that these regular people weren't going to go talk smack about the brand and ruin their reputation, but that there was a genuine like brand affinity here that we wanted to bridge the gap on. And so it took us a while, but eventually we got Amazon and eventually we got Disney to, to take the leap and, wow. and try this okay. with nano influencer. And then we got Dunkin' Donuts to do it. And then we got you know a variety of major agencies like Horizon Media and Publicis and Digitas to do it. And they're bringing it to their brand partners. And so I think for many of the brands that we worked with, we were the first leap of faith that they took on this new channel. We created over 10 million pieces of sponsored content this way. And with, I think out of the half million people who joined, about 400,000 of them ended up getting, you know, getting a paid opportunity through Heartbeat. Wow. Many of them are, were repeats. So, if, and we were fairly focused on the female and parenting category. So, um, but if you look at the landscape of Instagram creators and in something like 2019, and they had gotten paid work, very large percent of them had come through Heartbeat at one time. So yeah. the, the, one of the key insights was education. If you've never done a paid deal before, you got to know what the ins and outs are. What does brand safe mean? What is the brand thinking about when they say brand safe? What, uh, how do we package up these briefs in a way that somebody can look at it like while they're walking through their house and doing laundry or, or, you know, or like at work and go, okay, I get, I get what they're trying to say. I need to do cool. I can go do that. I can get it done. And it can be a win for the brand. The other thing is how to do these things at scale and which is got to be great at communication. You got to use inspirational content so people know what works and what's working. You got to make information easy to digest. And then you got to do strong uh, like communication with people to know so they know where they are in the stage. So you don't have to have a whole bunch of back and forth on stuff. Those are some of the insights that I took out of it. When I say pioneering, I think it's because we were bringing something to market that hadn't been done before and that there was a lot of trepidation about it. It took us a while to get those big brands to take the leap. It was after seeing yeah. smaller brands find success that they're like, wow, maybe we should try this. And then they were hooked. Wow. I mean, it's truly pioneering work, uh, Brian. I mean, amazing that you got so many people actually paid, not just, you know, categorize them. You gave them confidence, education, money, everything. So folks, we have a pioneer on our show to, uh, tonight. Many thanks to you, Brian, on behalf of everyone who's building creator economy. I think it's because of people like you, a lot of people are going to have more work in the future and continue to work and be passionate about it. So really glad coming back to uh, creator land what new functionalities should be you know should we be excited about that you're bringing to creator land because i'm a part of it now we recently ran a survey of our users like looking at the future we gave them a ton of options to tell us what did they think was going to be the most valuable and so what's in the roadmap for the next year ai powered matching i mean if you're not using it we, we think about ai the way that you know, someone might think about AWS or Google Cloud. It's a new tech. It helps you get to where you want to go faster, cheaper, and usually with a better user experience. We're implementing that for our matching, which means new relationship building, uh, hiring, especially, you know, like custom alerts based on your goals. So you can find the right people for what you're trying to achieve right now uh, and then work with them. We have right now an alpha product called Co-Creator, which is really an assistant that can be like a digital talent manager in your pocket. So wow. brainstorming ideas, thinking about modern content strategy, um, giving you somebody to maybe negotiate, help you negotiate. And I think that this over time, as it uses more and more of uh, the data that's available on the platform to help you in the things you're trying to achieve, becomes a, an integral part of the daily experience for a lot of uh, creators on the platform. Integrating analytics into the past work experience. So, you know, we want somebody to be able to create what we call projects, which is like a case study and a highlight, which is like a snippet of social or web content. Um, we want that to be really easy to do. So on your phone, in just a few clicks, you can come to Creator Land and have a resume really quickly based on the past work that you've done. Uh, this is one of our key priorities over the next you know, three months. And then there's been a lot of demand for kind of skill assessment and verification of work. So, you know, you've hired me, you know, you asked me to be on the podcast. Here I yep. am. I post this on my creator land profile and I invite you to verify that you, that, that it happened. And um, we think that this adds to the density of our social graph. 
meaning that you your followers can or your your connections can go oh who's brian oh the, this is on his profile too oh, the, like we're, we're increasing it's the like speed of password work, creation right? proof yeah, of like, work yeah um amazing and you know in the near term the last thing i'll say and there's a lot of really cool stuff we have on the on the roadmap but it, improving the learning and development aspect of our business we think that that's one of the biggest gaps in the industry and so centralizing the best advice and lifting up the voices who are sharing that with the world of the industry uh, we think is a really meaningful thing that we can do and so that's there's very high on our list of um, making a much bigger part of your experience on creator land nice so brian it looks like that you're pretty big on educating education uh, you know on all fronts for all the folks that are involved in creator economy is that a right assessment of your personal agenda let's say yeah it, it is i mean it's education isn't just formal education education is also me calling a founder friend of mine and saying hey i'm struggling with this what do you think and they go well you know here's here's my take and here's an article that you can go check out and i read that article and i take something valuable away or i watch a ted talk or i watch you know some video where somebody's also experienced this problem and found a way around it that to me is the most important type of education. Formal education can be helpful too with verification of skills and creating a nice baseline, but it's real world experience and that being passed amongst people who are sharing that experience that, um, that I think really unlock velocity in your career growth. And so that's huge for us. Um, we think it's one of the most meaningful things we can do. That's very commendable. Earlier you said that around 40,000 people are using uh, Creator Land. Right now, uh, you said like 10,000 on supply side. Can you give us a further breakdown? How many of them are brand managers, uh, talent managers, influencer marketers, creators? Is there a number on top of your head? Yeah, so um, about 25% of them are on uh, the side that we consider demand. So people who yeah. have day-to-day -day hiring roles. So influencer marketers, brand managers, founders, entrepreneurs, and then the we have about 10 percent of our audience is or membership are in the service provider category so this is talent managers um you know they are facilitating deals because of their they, th these are people who are the glue of the industry i mean you know yeah. you can't really have a really high powered youtube channel without a team you know your podcast probably has more than just you on the editing team yeah. and the production team and these people go unnoticed massively in the industry. They are the quiet heroes that make the whole thing work, uh, that never get celebrated because they're not the talent on camera. Um, so we really love this category. We find they're very active in the ecosystem. Uh, so that's about 10%. And then the rest of the membership is we, we consider talent. So the average following on um, our, you know, the main social platforms, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, tends to be around 100,000. So these are professionals. These are people who have uh, experience, real world experience. They, you know, they're looking for more work. They're looking to learn and share um, for kind of secondary platforms. I don't mean this as a negative. I just mean in terms of like where your largest audience is uh, like Spotify, Snap, Twitch, the average following there tends to be about 30 to 45,000. So still very high quality in terms of I mean, high quality. That's not right term, but you know, experience. These are people who have a real career that they're trying to right. expand. We also, we have other platforms too, but uh, you know, we're, we've seen a, a new rise in newsletters. So you can oh. connect your beehive uh, yeah. to creator I land that. or yeah. medium. And we're seeing that there's some pretty, you know, 100,000 plus subscribers coming through that, uh, people adding that to their channel, which is exciting. Great. So folks, uh, we are going to connect our beehive our newsletter as well on creator land we have like two three uh very specific uh newsletters going on so please check out uh, please follow us on creator land uh speaking of the glue brian as you suggested the 10 percent of the people folks like us how do you see philo like api solutions influencing the future of influencer marketing and where do you see us potentially helping you realize your dream of you know tapping into this vast 500 trillion 100 billion you know creator economy i think um you know with i think this kind of comes back to new technology as well i mean i think philo simplifies the data capture that could lead to really interesting tool development so um, if i want to 
better understand my audience or I want to better as a, as a platform builder or the audiences of my membership, make better connections between people or help them do their work faster, Simp uh, lowering the cost for the developer community on connecting to the platform APIs that are out there is a huge win. Uh, if you haven't gone through this process as a developer, it can be very challenging to navigate the connecting with those APIs. So, you know, you're, you're, th those things are constantly changing. There's a high cost to upkeep and there's a lot of like uncertainty on whether something will be continuous or that you actually get approved for something, et cetera. So, you know, I've been aware of Philo for a very long time um, from its early days, pre your, your seed round, I think I met the founding team um, was always very bullish on the opportunity there. And I think developers should look really closely at it to see if it can speed up um, letting them, there's a concept called like, well, I don't know what it's called, but it's like, basically does it make the beer taste better? And so if, your core competency is not API connection development with, because uh, <laughs> Philo's is, you know, they're thinking yeah. about how to make that beer taste better so that you as a developer can think about how to make what you do for your customers um, uniquely much more performant and much more uh, valuable to them without having to think about babysitting APIs. So when uh, I think about career land, I think about that through the same lens. Does it speed up delivery of value to our users? Then we'll look really closely at it. See, folks, that's exactly why we do this podcast, so that our guest can praise Philo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Brian is uh, too kind to do that. Let's take some, you know, fun rapid fire questions. If you could have any content superpower, what would it be? So... Uh, this is a fun one. I mean, maybe, maybe being the top comment on every viral TikTok. Wow. Okay. I do so, that on Instagram sometimes. Yeah. I mean, cause then you're not the one who has to make each piece of content, which is a lot of work, uh, and, and kind of impossible. Like if everything you did went viral, I don't even know if that would be a good thing, but if you can be the top commenter, then you get this whole brand of like always having the funniest thing yeah. and like getting all this attention and uh the distribution you get on your own channel be huge so i don't know i thought that would be a, a fun way to not, to like get a yeah, lot of attention fun. and I distribution mean, i've been getting notifications for like a couple of comments which i you know left on someone's post in 2023 and they are like 10k you know it's fun to you know be reminded of something that you posted why not it's very interesting what's your guilty pleasure content which you don't really talk about, but you love watching. Please tell us oh, today. <laughs> <laughs> so have you ever seen a video of these guys, I mean, these people in the South of the U S that are doing these, like, uh, it's called like a low country boil. And they'll be like, got to put the old Bay in. And they'll put like three cans from Costco of old Bay spice into this giant pot. And I like, gotta have the, Corn is like a giant, like 42 things of corn. Can't skip the onions. It's like this huge pile of onions. And like, yeah, get the, let's get the crabs in there. And it's like this giant pile. Of, and it goes on for like six or seven minutes. And you're like, God, this is so much stuff that's going here. It's very satisfying. And the, com and the commentary is always so funny. Um, sometimes on purpose, sometimes just because they're funny. And uh, I don't know, like that, I can't not watch a whole videos whenever I see it. <laughs> I remember, you know, this one kind of content that comes out again from southern part of America. Be a man, right? They play on the stereotype of being becoming a man. Like, oh, I know, you know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Don't share your pain. Be a man. Things like that. Really, really yeah, fine. That, that, that was a great trend. Yeah. And if you could, you know, time travel, right? Like Rick and Morty, would you go to the past or the future to impact creator economy? Would you change something in the past or would you, you know? build something in the future. Okay. Well, if you're going to the past, you'd have an opportunity to like go back to the Musical.ly team, which uh, ByteDance bought and turned into TikTok and say, hey, uh, I want to give you, I want to give you a little money. I want to get some equity. And then um, I'm going to paint the picture for someone to help you raise a billion dollars so you could be TikTok. And, um, and then it's, you know, then it's owned by you know, a U.S. based team that really created the format yeah. and we don't maybe have suggest the name itself, right? It was not TikTok back then. Maybe suggest the name itself. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And um, and say, look, this is what's going to happen. Uh, hold on to this. You know, maybe it wouldn't work if 
it was the original team, but maybe it would have. And I think that'd be super interesting. I think if you're going to the future, you're more reacting to what you find there and bringing advice from the past, which, you know, arguably, I guess they'd already have. So you, you'd be more, but I think it'd be incredibly interesting. I've, if someone gave me the choice to go to the past, the future and other contexts, I'd always pick the future because I'm just, you know, I'd love technology and, and love to see where it's going. But um, I think to have the maximum impact, you probably need to go backwards. That's fair. Uh, what advice would you give to 21-year-old Brian? Oh, 21-year-old Brian, I would say you need to move to the Bay back then. And okay. uh, that would have massively sped mm -hmm. up my career growth. But um, I also had a, you know, a mindset from my family growing up that was, I think, wrong for entrepreneurship, which was like, well, you know, in order to be an entrepreneur, you need to build up an equivalent level of income to your current role and then make the leap. And I have found that the best stuff that uh, has come out of the companies that I've built uh, and the teams that I've worked with have come when things weren't easy and you had to build the airplane in the air. And that's where a lot of innovation comes. Now that you got to balance your risk. I have a child now, so it's much harder to do that. But a 21 year old Brian didn't. And I think, you know, taking that leap and saying, you know what, I'm just going to go up to the bay and I'm going to make some friends. I'm going to sleep on some couches and I'm going to go work for a startup up there and get my feet wet in the industry earlier. Um, because within, I had always wanted to be an internet entrepreneur my whole life, literally since I was like 11. This is the first code I wrote was 11. The first website I launched was at 12 and I didn't get but within a year and a half of working for the first startup that I worked with, which is more in my late twenties, I had raised money and started my own company. It was just about exposure and, and seeing how to do it and seeing what was possible. And so I'd, I'd go, go back and say, look, surround yourself with people who are where you want to be, because that is going to give you what you want in terms of information. That's going to let you do what it is you dream about doing. It's very hard to go, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to, I don't know what the rest of that is. But if you want to succeed, bring a group like that mindset is go find the people who are already doing this and learn from them quick. And then you've got a little community and you can take the leap without being totally blind and, and guaranteeing almost failure. So that's what I would say. Wonderful. This is a wonderful message for the folks who are, you know, very young, 21. Please, this is the right piece of advice for you. Maybe you can see. do it on Creator Land. You know, come on yeah. in, <laughs> connect with some people, set up a Zoom or go meet in person. Yeah, yeah, great. Now, looking ahead, Brian, uh, what's next for you? We're going to keep building. Right now, we're, you know, I, I shared a little bit about what our roadmap is. We just, uh, we want our people to find more success. I mean, we are doing some experiments around monetization to give people who are looking to elevate you know, their distribution and, and make it a little bit easier to to build new connections and celebrate your successes on the platform, be discovered more easily. Uh, we're just starting that experiment. It's, starting to, it's going pretty well. So we're going to be keeping keeping the best there. But, you know, we're, we're just getting started. You know, we're like this is day one of a year long journey for us. Um, wow. We're, and I don't mean like tomorrow's day two. I mean, maybe next year's day two or something, you know, like we're just we're just at the beginning. So we're going to keep building. Wonderful. Uh, last couple of rituals that we make our guests go through. You have to give us a book recommendation. What are you mm. reading? Anything? Um, I just finished Hyperion, the first book in that series. It's sci-fi um, and it's really unique. Uh, I, I could not put that book down. So Can you spell the name again? Hi? Hyperion. So it's H-Y-P-E-R-I-O-N. Oh, and okay. I'm not sure Wonderful. when it was published, but it's, you know, it's been around for a little while, but it's, it's a really awesome book. So what's your favorite book of all time? Favorite book of all time? I can't say. I, I, I try and read about two books a month. So that's, that's the right most, answer, by the way. <laughs> you can't yeah. say, of course, you love reading books, of course. Yeah, you find you, you find something um, new and interesting each time you, you pick one up. And um, I'm a huge fan of sci-fi, fantasy, historical fiction. You know, who's the author that wrote... Uh, the Martian. The Martian, Andy Weir. One of my favorite books of all time, though, is called Hail Mary. Okay. That, if you only read one book this year, read that one. It's like so interesting. If you like sci-fi, and it's, I, I'm not, I, I can't say anything without spoiling it. It's got a take on, it's got science, it's got engineering, it's got interstellar travel. It's, uh, but it's very surprising. It's about a relationship, a very unexpected relationship that developed. I loved it. 
That's probably no, one I, I love show. I love sci-fi. Mandalorian is my very recent favorite TV show. I mean, it's awesome. Last thing, uh, would you like to nominate anyone for our show? There's so many people that I would think. You know, one guy who's great. Who, you, if you haven't had him on yet, is guy Phil Ranta, who's Phil pretty Ranta. popular on LinkedIn. Good yeah. friend, based in uh, LA. Uh, LA has become the a great center of the creator economy by uh, these people who've been in the industry for a long time, come up through multiple different channels and are building really interesting things. Uh, he's always got a really interesting take. He's got a lot of exposure to different things going on. So, um, you know, he's a good friend and somebody I'd always recommend on the podcast. Wonderful. Brian Freeman, it was a pleasure hosting you. Wonderful conversation. Great insights for everyone. You're a pioneer. There is no doubt about it. We hope you continue to empower creator economy. Yeah. More power to Creator Land and everyone who's building it. Thanks again for coming to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. And if you like the show, if you like what Brian says, his insights, please let us know what you think of this episode. Reach out to Brian, sign up on uh, Creator Land. We'll put a link in the description. Follow us everywhere. No brainer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Impulse, the influencer marketing podcast is brought to you by Philo. Philo is the easiest way to get access to authenticated creator data from hundreds of different platforms. To know more about Philo, visit getphilo.com. That's get p h y l l o.com. Also, make sure to search for Influencer Marketing Podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast listening platforms. And don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Philo, thank you so much for listening.